what we did last time, and then we'll move on uh, to looking at some of the calculations. Well, we'll probably get to the calculations today, but we'll look at understanding uh, the chemistry behind the system and using the ternary diagrams that I showed a little bit at the end of last class. So just a quick recap then. Uh, we're taking our PF, and our PF over there has some sol solutes that's of interest that we wish to recover. Uh, so for example, if our feed is primarily water and there's acetic acid in the water, acetic acid is our solute, and then our carrier would be water in that case. Combine it with some solvent. So in the case of uh, acetic acid and water, the typical one is ethyl acetate. We'll then combine ethyl acetate with our solvent, mix them very well in an earlier part of this extraction unit. So I've indicated that a bit up here on the whiteboard. Uh, we've got a, a high shearing metallic to get very good mixing between that feed and solvent. So we've got three species in this region that are very well mixed. There's mass transfer between the two pieces of the liquid. That solute, A, acetic acid in this example, then will transfer from the feed, the carrier, over to the solvent. And we then go through a settling stage in, the, in this unit where there is the single type of emulsion, those three chemical species then, over time, as we move through this unit in plug flow, will separate into the two distinct phases. So we get our two immiscible phases created over there, and the lighter phase uh, would then move to the top and the heavier phase to the bottom in this example. But in, either way, our terminology here is that the raffinate is the layer that contains the solid. And, sorry, our, our raffinate, I should be correct, that our raffinate is the layer that should contain less of the solid. So the raffinate should be much, much lower in concentration in the solute. The extract is the layer that contains our solute of interest. So up here, solute mostly present in this layer, the extract layer. And I just want to introduce some terminology a bit revised from last class. Uh, so last class I used primarily X and Y with the subscript A to refer to, this, to the solute A. But I've decided what I would rather do and be, uh, uh, work here is we drop the A because A is always our solute of interest. We don't really, we know that we're always referring to our solute. So let's use the terminology that X and Y represent the mass fractions of the solute. So we always refer to the mass fractions of the solute and then the subscript refers to the stream in which that solute occurs. So, for example, our feed contains X mass fraction of solute, and the F refers to the fact that that's the feed stream. YS is the mass fraction of the solute coming in in the solvent. What is that typically? Mass fraction of the solute in the solvent coming in. Typically, it's zero. We, we work with, if we're working with a pure solvent, especially in a batch, or the laboratory type system, Ys would be zero. There's no solute in the solvent. Uh, that solvent is going to be used to recover the solute. Once we mix it, that solvent then will lo get loaded up with the solute. So our solute transfers over to the solvent, and we call that stream leaving there now the extract phase. So the Ys subscripts refer to the fact that that's where the solute is going to go to. The solute goes from the X subscripts to the Y subscripts. So mentally you can just see it as our solute moving from an X subscript to a Y subscript. So our solute moving from our feed over to the extract over here. What's left over then is our raffinate. And very often we'll take this raffinate stream which still contains some solute but now less than what we started off with in the feed and we'll send this to a second stage. With, and we'll recontact it with solvent and try to extract further that the residual solute that's left over in the raffinate. And we may need a third stage or a fourth stage so we can then place them in, in sequence to get that. So we'll see some of that happening. Okay, so that's just some of the terminology then that we're going to use. And then this key value that we're interested in is the partition coefficient or the distribution coefficient D, which is defined as the ratio of the solute 
So it's always the ratio of the solute A. So I've decided to drop the A subscripts from now. It's the ratio of what's in the extract over that in the racinate. And we really want that value to be high, the D value. Because in any case, we can then preparation load up that solute. Sorry, load up that solvent with solute and extract it. And then the residual is left over in the racinate. So that's uh, a quick recap of last class, and then we, uh, we looked at a bit of why we're looking at liquid liquid equilibrium. I won't recap that, other than to say it really is a complementary unit to distillation. So when distillation is often not suitable or too energy intensive, then liquid liquid extraction would be a very good alternative. We mentioned then also that there's two major issues that we're wanting if we want very good mixing to get that mass transfer. But we also want the phases to separate again subsequent to that. Uh, so we want those droplets to coalesce and, and create the two distinct phases that then finally we can collect and leave it. So that's what we covered last time. And then uh, you may just want to quickly update this slide. Uh, the two major aims that we're always looking for in liquid liquid extraction is high recovery and a high concentration. What do we mean by that? A high recovery of solute means we want low values of solute left over in our raffinate stream. So the raffinate or the residual stream here, low concentrations of the solute in XR, and high concentrations of solute in Y. Both of those simultaneously, we've recovered that solute very highly. So the high level of recovery, if we can maximize YE and minimize XR. And in fact, that's exactly the definition of the distribution coefficient is to get a high distribution is Ye divided by Xr. So if we can maximize Ye and minimize Xr, in other words, we get a high distribution coefficient, we've done a great job. But not only that, we don't just want to, to get this, we also really want Ye to be high overall, so a high concentration of the solute uh, in that stream. It's no good having it, it so diluted in there. We get a high recovery, but it's, it's very dilute. We want it to be concentrated as well. And effective ways to do that is to use counter-current unit operations. We'll look at that coming up tomorrow. Um, we want to get very good mass transfer that's going to encourage that uh, or, or, or cause that solid to move from uh, the one liquid to the other and leave in the extract. Then we said, well, what I, I thought rather than to just jump into those ternary diagrams and start um, start looking at those, I mean, it's very tempting to do that, and I think a lot of uh, ways of the textbooks they tend to do that. They show those diagrams, like the McKay field diagrams, and you draw your zigzags all over there, and you count your number of stages, and it's, it feels very satisfying, but then we don't really actually know what these units look like. So let's take a look at what the units look like first, and then we understand a bit more what we're doing in those diagrams. So here we said last time that we've got mixing first and then settling. So mixing is can be done in any number of ways. You can use impellers and, uh, and, and mechanical agitation. You can mix in the nozzle in line. You can uh, mix in the pump. So put your two feet directly into the centrifugal pump and let the pump's impeller cause that mixing for you. Give teeth devices, I explained that last time. And then settling can be done with a number of, of ways to encourage that separation of the two liquid streams. So those are standard designs, we'll take a look at a few of them, called mixer settlers. We'll look at, at columns, and the columns can either contain just nothing, they just contain the two liquids moving counter current to each other in, with nothing uh, nothing stopping <coughs> their, their movements. We can add trades to those columns, we can add packing, we can create pulsation in the column, and, agitation, so I'll show a few of those. And then we'll look at, at, at a rotating device to help the separation. Now, the key point here at the bottom is I've added this liquid-liquid extraction is limited by equilibrium. So the same way you, you've seen in the lab, you take that funnel with the two liquid phases, you shake it up to cause contacting between the two phases, and the rate at which you get that separation uh, sorry, the rate at which you get the movement from one liquid stream to the other is purely limited by thermodynamics and the equilibrium there. It's not like the other unit operations that we've looked at so far, like sedimentation or um, centrifusion, where if we put in more energy into the system, we can get that separation to happen faster. 
Here, there's pretty much nothing we can do to create that, uh, encourage that separation to happen quickly. We're purely limited by equilibrium and, and, and how, how, that, how long that takes. Um, well, we can see what we can do, though, to encourage that a mass transit to happen a little faster, but we're still primarily limited by equilibrium constraints here. So let's take a look at some of these units. Here's a standard conceptual idea of a mixer settler. You wouldn't actually build one that looked like this, but the concept holds that you feed your two, um, the two streams, your, your carrier containing your solute and your solvent. Um, those are mixed in this contacting region. So a impeller there to contact those two liquid phases. And that gets forced out the top because I'm continually feeding new material in here. This causes overflow of those two well-mixed phases. And then I create three bands. The middle one, the dispersion band, contains the mixture. There is no mix, um, mixing in this region. So by pure gravity effects and just time, we're waiting for those two phases to separate. So there would be some form of blood flow along from left to right here. And during that, that time, we would see our lighter phase rising and our heavier phase sinking. And the, these sorts of units, these very large tanks, uh, are common in the mining industry where they rely on very, very high volumes to, to use for liquid liquid extraction. Just uh, some other modifications on that idea is Let's assume we've already got our, our liquids well mixed. So I've used a nozzle or some form of pump. And I'm inserting here that very well mixed three component system. And there's a, a baffle type device here, a flow distributor, that just encourages flood flow to happen. If that were not there, we'd start to get a sort of parabolic formation over here. So this uh, baffle uh, just encourages flood flow and uniformity. We then have a coalescence element, which is this proprietary, uh, you can buy from this company called Knitmesh. It's a coalescence, it just looks like steel wool, the, the stuff you use to <coughs> pots and pans with at home. It's just a whole collection of that uh, packed very tightly over here, and it encourages those two phases then to form coalescence and, and uh, start to separate out. So we can start to see our heavier phase sinking down here and our lighter phase up here. And so there we'll pull out our, our lighter phase at the top, our heavier phase at the bottom, and there's a, just a bit of a, a very crude control that is purely on-off control to, to monitor the level of that interface. So you just want to ensure that you don't drain your lighter phase out at the bottom, and you don't uh, flood, your, flood your unit and send your heavier phase out at the top. So very crude on-off control for high level and low level. Then uh, another way to visualize that same type of separator unit or settler is a horizontal settler with the same idea of a baffle to prevent uh, just to prevent uh, this flow straight through in a parabolic manner, so it just breaks breaks that flow up, and our phase is separating out, leaving the lighter phase at the top, the heavy phase at the bottom, and then this unit has an additional um, tap there for scum. So very often we will get some foaming forming at the interface, and so just to remove that, um, which are, that prevents the, the, the separation from happening effectively. If we accumulate a whole lot of scum in this interface, we'll eventually prevent separation of the phases, so we need to draw off that sort of emulsion and foam that, that comes in. So this is when we, we send a feed in that has a tendency to form emulsions. We need to be aware of that. Um, you, could, you could add a part of this sort of thing up here on the previous one as well. Um, however, you'll probably find that this, this coalescence uh, unit, that lid mesh coalescence, will, will, will hold up that scum for you. So periodically you have to clean, clean that unit out. Okay, any, any questions on the mixer of settler type concept? Yeah, so, so it's pure mixing followed by the separation step and then the, the draw off after that. Some other ways of, of doing this contacting and separation in a single integrated unit are by columns. Uh, so what we have here then is our heavier liquid. Let's assume that that 
contains our solvent as well. So that could be our carrier, our heavier liquid coming in. And in this case, we have primarily heavy liquid coming in and then our lighter phase coming in at the bottom. So here the majority of the, of the liquid is, is from the heavier stream, the heavier density stream. So we would call that the continuous phase. The distributed phase would be the lighter stream. So that's in smaller quantity, that's distributed. And this, there's no air in this column. This column contains purely the liquids of the two phases. So we're relying on the pure gravitational effects. This is Stokes law, pure Stokes law with these particles, the lighter particles, they're in an environment where the density difference is lower, and so they'll, they'll float up, and the heavier particles, they're exactly like uh, solid particles suspended in air or in the fluid, they start to sink. So it's purely relying on density differences and gravity differences. And what we hope is that as, they, as these particles coalesce, the diameter of the particles get bigger and they fall faster. Okay, so, if you're designing a column like this, what is your major design variable? What's your degree of freedom that you're going to use to adjust to make sure that you achieve the outlet concentrations that you're aiming for? Those holes to, to coalesce and the particles to come together. 
and it breaks up that axial dispersion, that parabolic profile from forming in the column. Uh, then we can do some other things, such as adding mechanical agitation into the column. So this slide I just added recently, but it's, it's, it's more just to illustrate the idea. It's, uh, we add these, this impeller in the center with multiple turbines at different heights, and then these uh, smaller baffles or spaces, as they're called, um, what this encourage this this as this is rotating, it's creating a high degree of shearing, encouraging those particles to mix. But then we'll also get coalescence, and those coalesced uh, uh, particles will accumulate under the baffle and then rise up. They'll get sheared again, move up to the next baffle, they coalesce and they rise up, and so that, that keeps going. Other designs will then also pulsate this column, that, that impeller in the center, they will move up and down to create up and down mixing. And then further still, you can add layers of packing, so that mid mesh type idea can be added in, in periodically to create coalescence. So all of those, those features are then seen in, in columns. So just to go back here then, I had that up as a summary. So you'll, we'll either have our columns with nothing in them, we'll add trays to encourage mixing and coalescence, uh, we'll add packing, pulsation, and agitation. So there's a variety of patented uh, designs. Uh, some designs put that the whole mixing in, in an asymmetrical way in the column, so it's not necessarily mounted in the center, it's mounted off to the side of the column, which creates an interesting region then for um, counter current flow to occur and, and settling to occur inside the same column. So, very, very interesting uh, designs, and, and um, there's like there's too many to go through here um, and the different relative advantages. So, my point of, of showing you this is just to indicate that designing these units is not a straightforward thing. As you can see, there's so many different designs possible, and so ultimately what it comes down to is what are the species you're interested in separating, and then you work with a vendor or a supplier to, to come up with a design that's appropriate for your separation. But there's no way that we can go look at designing all, all, all types of columns. There's just too many different variations on them. And then the last one here, uh, this one is used when you're uh, dealing with two solvents that tend to foam or form emulsions quite easily. So this is a very gentle way of contacting the fluids. Uh, up here we have our, our lighter phase, so that's not air. Um, that's the, your lighter liquid. This entire uh, circle is filled with, with the two liquids. And so as this unit is rotating uh, counterclockwise here, we've got um, the lighter phase being pulled into the heavier phase in those that lighter phase droplets moving up and then the converse happens in, in the top half. In the longitudinal direction, we have, for example, uh, we have countercurrent flow, so you may have your, your solvent coming in over here at, at the bottom, and then flowing countercurrent where you're pulling off your extract. And then here we've got our feed coming in at the other side and then leaving the raffinate. So material flows in a countercurrent manner, and then it's being rotated in a circular manner as well. What we'll see then uh, is next class is we can then link these units up. So we'll, we're going to first look at just studying one, one mixer and settler today, and then we'll start to take it to two and three, and then count the current flow. So here they're in series. We've got a mixer followed by a settler, where that settler then we separate off our extract, that's our richer phase, and then our raffinate phase, which contains a uh, low solute concentration. But that solute concentration left over in the raffinate is still appreciable. We still want to extract that solute, and so we contacted the fresh solvent up here. So we, we put more fresh solvent in, recontacted with the raffinate, and then leaving out here in the second stage is, is, is a, should be a raffinate that's almost free of solute, and our extract here has picked up the remaining solute. So it's just a, a series cascade of, of mixes and samples. We'll, we'll learn in the class today and, and next class how to how many of these we will need. Okay, so let's take a look then at just linking this all up conceptually. Um, so what we put, let's just take this as an example. I've got acetic acid over here, so that's my solute, and it's coming in a feed of water. 
So acetic acid, solute, my feed is water. And then I'm putting it into an extraction tower where I'm feeding my solvent over here. It's coming around and putting solvent in and these two are moving counter current. So my, my feed coming in with acetic acid, water, and my lighter <coughs> solvent coming in at the bottom, my, head, my lighter liquid. Those two get contacted in the tower and the extract leaving at the top is primarily what would be the concentration, what would you expect to see in the extract? High solvent, high solute, high carrier. What is in that extract stream? The solvent should be there and the solute. So this extract stream should be primarily solute and solvent. So that's our extract stream. The raffinate stream should be primarily carrier liquid with residual sol with residual solute. So raffinate low concentration of solute, but mostly the original carrier fluid, which in this case was water. Okay. So it's one thing to create the separation, it's then now quite another to work with it efficiently. We don't just want to always spend money on solvent, uh, that mass separating agent we would like to recover. So what we do is let's take a look at this. Uh, here's our solute and our solvent now in an extract stream. We heat it up in a heat exchanger, preheat it and send it to a distillation tower. That distillation tower then is used to separate out that solvent, which should then rise up to the top. So our solvent comes up to the top, and we'll deal with that in a minute. Our solute of interest, in this case, is a C gas. It comes out at the bottom, and we cool it down, and we get very high purity of C gas coming out of the bottom. So we recover our solute of interest, the C gas, in this case, from the solvent in a second distillation step. So we've got our first step is liquid-liquid extraction, but that's not getting us our pure solute of interest. We're getting our solute then mixed up with the solvent. So to, to then recover that solute, acetic acid, the valuable component, then we distill off the solvent from it. So we boil off the solvent, <coughs> recover the solvent up at the top, and we're going to recycle the solvent to reuse again. The pure acetic acid that's heavier comes out and we sell that. So that should be a 99, 99.5% purity type of acetic acid there. So we've got a second unit operation to recover the valuable solute from the solvent. And solvent's also valuable that we, we don't want to keep repurchasing solvent, we want to recycle it and reuse it. Let's take a look at the raffinate stream. This stream should be primarily water, um, and there may be uh, some of the solute in there as well. So we take our raffinate and we, we preheat it and we send that to distillation. But we also combine it with this up here. So this sol solvent up here will also contain some of the carrier fluid. This solvent coming up at the top is not pure solvent. There's going to be carrier fluid mixed up in that. We're not always going to get a perfect separation uh, in this extraction unit. So it's, very, it's, it's always the case that what's coming out in the raffinate and the extract contains all three species. Don't ever think that because we've drawn it like this, that this is only the carrier fluid with residual sol solute. There's also some of the solvent mixed up in here. And in this extract stream, there's also some of the carrier fluid mixed up in there. So that's why this flow sheet then becomes so integrated, is we're taking this uh, solvent, which also contains some of the water, the carrier fluid, and that gets knocked out in a knockout drum. Phase separation occurs, the lighter phase, the solvent gets recycled, the heavier phase, water, it's combined with this water, primarily water raffinate stream here, fed to the distillation, and this distillation then separates out water from that residual solvent as well. So then we recycle the solvent from this distillation, and primarily the bottoms from this second stream is water that we can now waste. That water should be a pretty pure water stream. So we have to see these units integrated with each other to, to solve and understand. How, they, how the flow sheet works, and what, especially because when we're designing these units, we have to know what the solute, the solvent contains. This is never going to be a pure solvent. 
that solar being recycled over there will also contain the other two species that appear in the flow sheet because there's this recycling happening. Okay, so important to understand how these fit in with each other. Okay, so given that, yeah, Patrick. Uh, just a question. Like, if you have an extractor and a distillation all in the same thing, essentially, how do you know when to use both, like when to use one, when to use like a large one? And Okay, yeah, so remember we said earlier that liquid-liquid extraction is a complementary unit to distillation. And one reason why we don't want to use distillation and we want to use liquid-liquid extraction is because of the very high energy requirements of distillation. And now I'm showing you and just adding distillation back in the subsequent step. What happens is if we, uh, I, 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 can, I will post on the website a, a flow sheet for the same system but with um, the mass balance written in on every stream. What you see then is that this stream coming in is about 30% acetic acid and 60, 70% uh, water. So if we distill that, the heat of vaporization of water is huge. So our energy to vaporize 70% water is, is high. Right? So we wouldn't want to do that. But what we find then is that when we come to these two distillations, those two distillations, the, the volume of water that we deal with is low. And secondly, we don't, boil, we don't vaporize it because the water comes out in the bottoms. So we don't actually have to take it from the liquid phase to the vapor phase. Except for a small amount over here that does get vaporized. So, so the energy requirements overall of this, if you saw it as a, an overall energy balance on this flow sheet, would be much less than a single distillation column. So that, that's a good, a good question to understand why we've gone from distillation to using liquid extraction. So the question is, what would you do for a heat-sensitive material to purify the extract? You could then use uh, membrane separation, or um, so reverse osmosis, where you've got two liquids now, and you, one flows preferentially through a membrane, um, or centrifusion. So any number of those alternatives that don't require any heat input to, to separate would work. So very often these distillations can be replaced by centrifuges because they're just two liquid species with two different densities. Okay, so I'd like you, given this context of uh, what, what these units look like, so we've looked at mixes, settlers, trays, columns, <coughs> and uh, we've understood a bit about what the units are upstream and downstream of liquid-liquid extraction. Take, a, take two, three minutes to talk with the person next to you and discuss what are good properties of a solvent. This is the hardest part of, of, of um, designing a liquid-liquid extraction. As uh, Schweitzer's textbook says, the choice of solvent for liquid-liquid extraction can often have more significant impact on the process economics than any other design decision. So you may choose the incorrect column, too big, too small, that's not going to cost you nearly as much money as making a bad decision on the solvent. So a bad decision on a choice of solvent is going to always cost you more in the long run because this is a, a, a species that has to be replaced from time to time. Um, so what are properties that we need to look for? So take a minute or two and then we'll just brainstorm some ideas back and then take it from there.
Okay, who wants to go first? Any, what other properties other than hold? Fast. Fast? Fast? Okay. If hold goes first and getting an easy one out of the way. Okay, sorry. Density of the solvent. Why is density important? Lighter than heavier. So density, especially the density difference with the other stream. doesn't use the principle of volatility differences, downstream we're going to have a distillation column potentially to then separate that solvent out. So that, that needs to be in the criteria as well as what comes after the liquid liquid extraction. Something else? Toxicity. Toxicity. And why? It's about to remove the Right, so we've seen here um, and in that integrated flow sheet prior that all three species come out in all the streams over here. Our raffinate will contain all three species, extract, and uh, our, our, maybe not our feed, but that's obviously what we're going to purify. So coming out here, we're going to get all three species present, and we're going to sell that solute, maybe for human consumption or something that will involve people or animals later on. So we want to make sure we can eliminate that solvent as much as possible, or choose a solvent that's non-toxic, because there's going to be a residual amount of solvent coming in that final product. So for example, in that acetic acid example, whatever the solvent was that we were recycling through that flow sheet, there will be 0.001 or some low percentage of solvent still remaining in your final product. So that's an important criteria. Yeah. Anything else? And why would, what effect do you think that would have? Again, the biological system is the major regulator of proteins or bacteria. Okay, so if you're dealing with biosensitive materials, pH would uh, modify and or perhaps break down. Uh, we'll talk about pH in a minute coming up. That has another unintended effect. Sometimes, actually. Just thinking more generally the chemical properties of the solvent, how it interacts with the solute and the other bacteria. The carrier? Okay. So important is the, the general properties of the solvent. So the, that first one up there is that it's going to have a high distribution coefficient for the solute. So the solvent should load up that solute preferentially. Conversely, you want to pick a solvent that has a very low selectivity for the carrier. You don't want a solvent that will pick up both the solute and the carrier. So that's, that's an important one. So uh, you can either write these all down or you can download it off the website uh, after the class. So the second one over there is a low distribution coefficient for the carrier, is, is, a, is another critical one. Um, relative vol reasonable volatility difference, Cameron mentioned that one earlier, uh, is an interesting one. A reasonable surface tension. What do I mean by reasonable surface tension? A solute that has a very high surface tension is not going to mix easily with the carrier and is not going to encourage good mass transfer. But a solvent with too low a surface tension is going to be very easy to disperse, but then hard to recoalesce again. So this one's a tough one to pick. Surface tension, there needs to be a balance to allow easy dispersion, but still also allow both particles to recoalesce. Good density difference, as was mentioned. Uh, you want the solvent to be stable so that you can reuse it. You don't want it to break down as you, as you recycle it over and over. Um, it needs to be inert to the materials of construction, no, cause no corrosion in those columns. Uh, and that's an important one because many solvents are particularly corrosive. So that's an important selection criteria. Low viscosity to maximize mass transfer, safe, non-toxic, non-flammable. That's very hard to find a good solvent that's non-toxic and non-flammable. Uh, cheap, easily available, we call mentioned that cheap part, compatible with carrier and solute, so it avoids contamination. Uh, that ties up with the toxicity issue as well. And doesn't cause foaming or scum formation or emulsions. Okay, so this is, there's, there's a few more criteria as well, I saw that I can fill into the slide. So 
picking a solvent is really, really tough, and it's a trade-off amongst many, many of these criteria. But the most important one by far is that it's supposed to, in terms of mass transfer, is getting a high distribution for uh, the solute and a low, low distribution coefficient for the carrier. Okay, I'll skip over this slide. This is more uh, for laboratory use of determining a D value. Um, you can read through it, it's very simple to understand, but the key point here is that we can get those D values from carries uh, that we pre-computed for many, many systems and engines. Okay, so now I'd like to just take, turn to um, these triangular phase diagrams. So we've seen these sorts of diagrams in, we've probably seen it in your 2D or 2F course, you see it in your chemistry course. So let's just take a quick recap of it. Um, and rather than me talk about it, I will let this other guy talk about it. There's a better job than mine. This recast is going to go over a phase diagram for a ternary system. So we can take something that's partially missile, three species, water, acetone, and MIBK. And we can represent them here by this, by this triangular phase diagram. All right, now it's important to notice that this particular phase diagram is for a system where the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Now two things could happen when we mix these three species together in a liquid form. One, they can remain as a single phase, or two, they can separate into two phases. And this all depends on the amounts of each species and the solution. For example, if we were to make a solution that we'll call solution A, and we'll say that it is 70% acetone, 10% water, and 20% MIBK, we can plot exactly where the solution is in the phase diagram. I'm going to use a highlighter to do this. You can see that as we increase up towards acetone, the top of that triangle would represent 100% acetone solution. So 70% would be somewhere along this line. We do the same thing for the water. A 10% solution of water would be somewhere along this line. And then a 20% solution of MIBK just so happens to fall where these two already intersect. So we would represent this point, solution A, right there. Now as you can see, this is outside of this envelope region. We'll call this region 1. Well, when any solution falls in region 1, it stays as a single phase liquid. So the other thing that could happen is if we fall under that envelope. So let's make up a solution that might do that. Let's say solution B is 33% by mass. Again, all of this is by mass. 33% acetone, 33% MIBK, and 33% water. Otherwise, equal mass ratio of all three species. When we look at the lines here, 33% is going to fall somewhere above that 30 line. MIBK is going to be somewhere along their 30 line, and water somewhere in perfect 30 line. This ball looks exactly dead center in the triangle for this phase diagram, so we'll draw that right around there. Now the trick here is, as I mentioned, it separates into two phases. These lines that you see are known as tie lines. They connect compositions in the two liquid phases in equilibrium. You basically go to each side following those tie lines as guides. So if we do that, we're going to come along here to this side and up here to this side. And just as a disclaimer, reading any kinds of diagrams or plots can be a little open to interpretation. So hopefully our answers are somewhat similar to each other's. This is going to be known as the water rich phase because it's heavy in water. And this is going to be known as the MIBK rich phase because it's obviously heavy in MIBK. So now we read these two separate plots. For the MIP, it looks like about 53% MIBK. And then if we read the acetone, we're going up in the plot. So we have 10, 20, 30, just under 40. So we'll say, I don't know, maybe around 38 weight percent. At this point, you could just add them up to one. And if we go towards water, I think weight percent looks pretty good. So that's the MIBK's rich phase. The water rich phase, we just go to the other side and we're going to look and it's about, I'm going to say 67% water. 
and then we go up towards acetone, so it's about a little higher than 25, somewhere between 25 and 30, so we'll say to 28 weight percent acetone. That leaves us with 5 weight percent K, which is right around that line, so that looks pretty good. So we started with the equal mass of each species, and they face separate rich equilibrium. At 25 degrees Celsius, we had two phases with the following compositions. Okay, so make sure you understand that. It's like treat it as if I was just telling you all that stuff. And you can always, uh, that video is downloaded on, uh, on the website there, so you can uh, watch it again. We're going to use that tomorrow quite substantially, this idea is uh, to, to solve the problem. So you, you must understand what's going on here. The key is, if you put it, as he's shown here, 30, 30, the 33, 33, 33% mixture, if we leave that to equilibrate, it's going to separate out into two phases. This water-rich phase over here, and then the K-rich phase over there. Which one of those is the raffinate, and which one is the extract? Which is the raffinate? Water-rich phase. And I'm assuming by saying that, that this acetone is the solute. So if acetone is my solute of interest, my raffinate is the water-rich phase because it's got less acetone in 28 weight percent. And the MIBK rich phase is the, is the extract that contains 38 percent. So the difference there of about 10 percent by weight in the raffinate stream versus the extract stream. So this terminology, uh, we'll use that this is called the, raff the raffinate envelope. This side of the, of the curve is the raffinate envelope. And then this other side is the extract envelope. Your extract envelope, those along those tie lines, must always be higher than on the raffinate side. The line slopes upwards because that's my extract side. So what I like to do is um, I'm not going to go through the rest of the material, but you notice there there are four, there are five questions. Um, Let me just cover this and then, then we'll talk about five questions. We've got two minutes. Uh, the key, key point here, and you'll use this, uh, you may have derived this from uh, previous courses, and if you haven't, it's quite straightforward. It's a simple mass balance. But if I take a mixture of P, uh, sorry, if I take a quantity of P and a quantity of Q, so P is given by that composition over there, Q is given by that composition, and I mix them up, I will obtain a mixture K that lies on a straight line connecting P versus Q. Okay. So this is the mass composition of Q, the mass composition of P, the mass composition of that mixture then is K. And K's location along that straight line is given by the relative amounts that I mix. So if I take the amount Q in grams or kilograms, divided by the amount P in grams or kilograms, I can form that ratio PK divided by KQ. So let's just take a look at the numerator. This is not working. So my numerator is PK, is, and then the, the other amount in the numerator is Q. It's the third letter. My denominator is KQ. The other amount in the denominator is P. So that ratio is then called the Lima rule. That distance PK divided by the distance KQ is proportional to the amount of Q divided by the amount of P. So it's not proportional to it. It's equal to, I should say. So we can always calculate for a given mass of P and a given mass of Q what that my mixture will be and what that composition of the mixture will be. The converse also applies. If I take a mixture K and I separate from it a portion Q, my remainder is going to be at P. Okay, so remember these are, are invisible fluids, so if I take my mixture K and I allow it to separate into Q and P, I can always find what one is from the other. Um, and this rule applies anywhere in this diagram, not just here in the innocent region. I can also use it up here or across the boundaries. So this, this rule is important to understand, as well as how we use this diagram. Uh, we're going to use it to answer these five questions tomorrow, which you're welcome to try it before we get to class.